words. After Pia had dressed and changed, she crawled back to the front of the boat with the checkered towel in her hands. She tried to ask Fokir the name of the fabric, but her gestures of inquiry elicited only a raised eyebrow and a puzzled frown. This was to be expected, for he had so far shown little interest in pointing to things and telling her their Bengali names. She had been somewhat intrigued by this, for in her experience people almost automatically went through a ritual of naming when they were with a stranger of another language. Fokir was an exception in that he had made no such attempts, so it was scarcely surprising that he should be puzzled by her interest in the word for this towel. But she persisted, making signs and gestures until finally he understood. Gamcha, he said laconically, and of course that was it. She had known it all along. Gamcha. Gamcha. How do you lose a word? Does it vanish into your memory like an old toy in a cupboard and lie hidden in the cobwebs and dust waiting to be cleaned out or rediscovered? There was a time once when the Bengali language was an angry flood trying to break down her door. She would crawl into a wardrobe and lock herself in, stuffing her ears to shut out those sounds. But a door was no defense against her parents' voices. It was in that language that they fought, and the sounds of their quarrels would always find their find ways of trickling in, under the door and through the cracks the level rising until she thought she would drown in the flood. Their voices had a way of finding her, no matter how well she hid. The accumulated resentments of their life were always phrased in that language, so that for her, its sounds had come to represent the music of unhappiness. As she lay curled in the cupboard, she would dream of washing her head of those sounds. She wanted words with the heft of stainless steel, Sounds that had been boiled clean, like a surgeon's instruments, tools with nothing attached except meanings that could be looked up in a dictionary, empty of pain and memory and inwardness. In the bedroom of Pia's early childhood, there was one window that afforded a glimpse of Puget Sound. The apartment was small, two bedrooms, a living room and a kitchen, and the sliver of a view through the one westward-facing window in the master bedroom was his only noteworthy attraction. There were never any question that she, two-year-old Pia, would be allotted that room. Pia was the altarpiece around which their lives were arranged. The apartment was a temple to her, and her room was its shrine. Her parents took the other bedroom, so small that they had to get into bed by climbing over the foot of the bedstead. This enclosed space became the echo chamber for the airing of their mutual grievances. They would while away their hours bickering over trivia, only occasionally generating enough energy to launch into full-throated thro quarrels. Pia had the larger room to herself for some five years before her mother abruptly ousted her from it. She could no longer bear the circumstances of her confinement with Pia's fa father and wanted nothing more than to shut up the entire family. Shortly afterwards, she would be diagnosed with cervical cancer, but in between was a period when she would allow Pia to sit beside her on her bed. Pia was the only person allowed into her presence, permitted to touch and see her. Everyone else was excluded, her father most of all. Her mother's voice would greet her as soon as she let, let herself into the flat on coming home from school. Pia, come and sit. It was strange that she could not remember the sound of those words. Were they in English or Bengali? but she could perfectly recall the meaning, the intent, the voice. She would go in and find her mother curled up in bed, dressed in an old sari. She would have spent the whole morning in the bathroom, trying to cleanse herself of some imaginary defilement, and her skin would be dimpled from its long immersion.
It was only then, sitting beside her, looking towards Puget Sound, that she learned that her mother had spent part of her girlhood staring at a view of a river, the Brahmaputra, which had bordered on the Assam tea estate where her father had been manager. Resting her eyes on the sound, she would tell stories of another happier life of playing in sunlit gardens, of cruises on the river. Later, when Pia was in graduate school, people had sometimes asked if her interest in the river dolphins had anything to do with her family history. The suggestion never failed to annoy her, not just because she resented the implication that her interests had been determined by her parentage, but also because it bore no relation to the truth. And this was that neither her father nor her mother had ever taught, thought to tell her about any aspect of her Indian heritage that would have held her interest. All they ever spoke of was history, family, duty, language. They had said much about Calcutta, for instance, yet had never thought to mention that the first known specimen of Oracella brevetoris was found there that strange cousin of the majestic killer whales of the Puj of Puget Sound. Soon it became clear that Fokir was making preparations for a meal. From the bilges below deck, he pulled out a com couple of large and lively crabs. These he imp imprisoned in a soot-blackened pot before reaching into the hold again for a knife and a few utensils, including a large cylindrical object that appeared to be an earthenware vessel. But there was a hole in the side of this vessel, and when he began to stuff bits of firewood into it, she realized it was a portable stove made of clay. He took the stove to the stern, and when it was well out of the way of the shelter's inflammable roof, he lit a match and blew the firewood into flame. Then he washed some rice, drained it into a battered tin utensil, poured in some water, and put it on the stove. While the rice was coming to, to the boil, he dismembered the crabs, cracking their claws with his knife. When the rice was done, he took the pot off the fire and replaced it with yet another blackened aluminum pot. Next, he opened a battered tin container and took out some half dozen twists of paper which he unrolled and laid out in a semicircle around the stove. There were spices inside and their colors, red, yellow, bronze, were bright in the light of the hissing flame. After he had splashed some oil into the pot, his hands began to fly over the slips of paper, peppering the spitting oil with pinches of turmeric and chili, coriander and cumin. The smells were harsh on Pia's nose. It was a long time now since she had eaten food of this kind. While in the field, she rarely ate anything not from a can, a jar, or a packet. Three years before, when working on Malampaya Sound, in the Philippines, she had been incautious in her eating and had suffered to the point where she had to, she had to, she had had to be medevaced by helicopter to Manila. On every survey since, she had equipped herself with a cache of mineral water and portable food, particularly high-protein nutrition bars. On occasion, she also carried a jar or two of Ovaltine or some other kind of powder for making malted milk. When there was milk to be had, fresh or condensed, she treated herself to a glass of Ovaltine. Otherwise, she managed to get by on very little. A couple of pro protein bars a day was all she needed. This procedure had the added advantage of limiting the use of unfamiliar and sometimes unspeakable toilets. Now, as, as she sat watching Fokir at the stove, she knew she, he would offer her some of his food and she, would, she knew also she would refuse it. And yet, even as she recoiled from the smell, she could not tear her eyes from his flying fingers. It was as though 
She were a child again, standing on tiptoe to look at a clutch of stainless steel containers lying arrayed on the counter beside a stove. It was her mother's hands she was watching as they flew between those colors and the flames. They were almost lost to her, those images of the past, and nowhere had she less expected to see them than on this boat. There was a time when those were the smells of home. She would sniff them on her mother on the way back from school. They would fill the lift on its journey up to their floor. When she stepped inside, they had greeted her like domesticated animals, creatures with lives of their own, sustaining themselves on clothes, hot air of the apartment. She had imagined the kitchen as a cage from which they never ventured out, which was why it came doubly as a shock when she discovered from pointed jokes and chance playground comments that the odors followed her everywhere like unseen pets. Her response was to fight back with a quietly ferocious tenacity against them and against her mother, shutting them away with closed doors, sealing them into the kitchen. But here, the ghost of these creatures seemed to be quieted by their surroundings. The spell of Fokir's fingers was broken only when a breeze carried the acrid odor of burning chilies directly into her face. And then suddenly the phantoms came alive again, clawing at her throat and her eyes, attacking her as though she were an enemy who had crossed undetected. She ret retreated to the bow, and when he followed her there, with a plate full of rice and cooked crab, she fended him off with her protein bars and her bottled water, smiling and bobbing her head in apology, to show she meant no offense. He accepted her refusal with a readiness that surprised her. She had expected protests, exclamations, a show of being wounded or hurt. But there was none of that. Instead, he gave her a nod and a long, cool look of appraisal, as though he were mentally going through a list of reasons why she might decline to accept food from his hands. It alarmed her that he might imagine that it was for some mysterious reason of caste or religion, that she had refused to eat his food, so she placed a hand on her belly and acted out a little charade of her intestinal sufferings. This seemed to serve the purpose, for he laughed, throwing his head back, and gave the plate to Tutu, who devoured it greedily. After the meal, the utensils and the stove were put back in the hold, and an armload of mats and blankets was taken up. Tutu, already drowsy, unrolled one of the mats under the shelter and fell asleep quickly, with a blanket pulled over his head. Unfurling a second mat next to the boys, Fokir made a sign to Pia, indicating that this was to, her, this was to be her place for the night, but she had a mat of her own, a thin sheet of blue foam tied to the frame of one of her backpacks. Undoing the bungee cord that held it in place, she unrolled the mat so that its head was pointing towards the bow, almost touching the boat's rounded prow. He started in alarm on realizing that this was where she was planning to spend the night. Shaking his head, he raised a finger of warning to point to, to the for forested shores in the distance. The gesture was intentionally vague, and only by inference did she understand that his warning concerned an animal, a predator. And now, at last, she had an inkling of why the boat had been anchored in this odd position. Was it perhaps to put it beyond the reach of tigers? She had never had much interest in terrestrial carnivores, but she could not imagine that even the hungriest of them would choose to stage an attack so far from shore. And if it did... What difference would it make whether you were in the stern or the bow? Presumably the whole boat would tip over under a tiger's weight. There was a commutative absurdity about these propositions that made her smile. To include him in the joke, she made her hands into claws, as if to mime a tiger. 
But before she could complete the gesture, he clamped his hands on her wrists, vehemently shaking his head as if to forbid her from making any reference to the subject. She decided it was best to shrug the matter off and, smoothing her mat, she lay down. This seemed the most economical way of letting him know that she was not going to spend the night huddled in the shelter for fear of an aquatic feline. To her great relief, he accepted this without protest. Removing the sari from the thatched hood, he folded it into a pillow and handed it to her, along with one of his grimy, gray blankets. Then, retreating to the center of the boat, he draped a blanket over his shoulders and lit a beady. In a while, just as she was drifting off to sleep, she heard a snatch of a tune and realized he was humming. She raised herself on her elbow and said, Sing. He gave her a puzzled glance and she responded by making an upward gesture with an open palm. Louder. Sing louder. At this he lifted, he tilted his head back and sang a few notes. The melody surprised her for it bore no resemblance to any Indian music she had ever heard before. Neither the Hindi film music her father liked nor the Bengali songs her mother had sometimes sung. His voice sounded almost hoarse, and it seemed to crack and sob as it roamed the notes. There was a suggestion of grief in it that unsettled and disturbed her. She had, th she had thought that she had, been, that she had seen a muscular quality of innocence in him, a likable kind of naivete, but now listening to this song, she began to ask herself whether it was she who was naive. She would have liked to know what he was singing about and what the lyrics meant, but she knew too that a river of words would not be able to tell her exactly what made the song sound as it did right then in that place.